have ten headings that I developed while I was listening to the panelists and to the subsequent discussion. The first is that there are now frameworks that describe ways in which it may be possible for external bodies, particularly uh, donors, and of course governments, to help enable societies to improve their resilience. Uh, the conceptual framework produced by John at the beginning of his presentation is one that I think we should all look at and test. We should share it with the communities with whom we're working in different forms to see how they uh, feel it helps them. We should also continue to look at the work of the, um, uh, the productive safety net programs in Ethiopia, which Susan referred to. Again, uh, thinking about whether they offer some models. Secondly, we heard particularly from uh, Honduras about ways in which it is possible through participatory working and through the application of science, through encouraging local communities to put that science into the local context, to work systematically for greater resilience and to measure the impact. We also heard how forecasting and other interventions from John can help with that local capacity to increase resilience. There were some very practical suggestions. And in addition, we heard how inappropriate policies in Honduras have actually worked against that resilience. That suggests that if we apply a resilience mesh or uh, framework to a number of policies and programs, we may be able to improve the impact of such investments. Thirdly, we heard several suggestions, particularly from Susan, but also from John, and also, I just didn't write down your first name. Marvin. You see, I wrote it and I couldn't read my writing. Such a good name. Hank Marvin, Marvin Gay. There's some very good Marvins around. <laughs> Remembered. Uh, so uh, I thought that it was, we heard some very good suggestions of ways to strengthen such institutions and also ways to undermine them. Fourthly, we had much emphasis on the importance of individuals being empowered for resilience, and in particular the critical role of adequate nutrition in early life as a contributor to, to effective resilience. We also heard how there were a number of other interventions, access to cash, improved assets, and also improved organization that would empower for resilience. Fifthly, undercutting all the presentations was thoughts about ways to ensure that investments do not undermine resilience, do not destroy capacity. Sixth, one completely new strand in the discussion during the panel was the importance about resilience being a necessary platform for opportunism. Going further, point seven, we could actually recognize that all life is risky, that all life involves choices, that adaptation and transformation requires choices. And therefore, resilience is not just about maintaining livelihood security, it's also about having platforms that enable people to take risks to improve their livelihoods. And it's also about having protection against collapse of the household or society if the risks that are taken turn out to be damaging. 
So let us think a bit more about resilience for opportunism and resilience for risk taking. Point eight, this might lead us to think more about the kinds of resilience that we seek to promote. In my experience, societies do best if they have the political space and the economic and social springboards that permit them to take opportunities for growth and opportunities to strengthen their situation. So it may be that there are aspects of resilience that need more attention during the discussions today to particularly take account of Ishmael's point that the way in which we were defining resilience perhaps during my presentation was not appropriate for the kinds of developments that we work on. And this may also help us to better team up with the business sector who understand about the importance of a resilient base from which to be able to take risks for growth. Nine, there was discussion again about measurement, particularly from the floor. And perhaps we need, if we accept that resilience applies to dealing with big threats like floods, dealing perhaps with more day-to-day -day risks like hunger or like violence or like loss of health, that we may need to think about what kinds of stress testing is needed for those two situations. Neither is difficult. We have all been involved in forecasting to anticipate what would happen to societies in the event of illness like HIV AIDS or in the event of drought. And this kind of stress testing is applicable as a base for resistance, resilience. And we can increase that to consider how to stress test for the kind of resilience that gives people the political space for action by anticipating what will happen if their freedoms are limited in any way. Point 10, there were several further reminders that the architecture and drivers of agency practice, whether it's within government or international organizations, particularly at headquarters level, creates a siloed pushing mentality that can at times undermine the behaviors that will be necessary, particularly for this idea of resilient spaces and springboards for opportunity. And particularly I thought uh, our colleague from African Development Bank, Josephine, pointed out that in the absence of local coordination platforms, the push through effect of central silos is destructive and that perhaps therefore we need to further identify the kinds of platforms that are necessary that will allow the sort of empowering support uh, to come through. And Stefan said, what are the bottlenecks? I personally believe that it is the siloed mentality that creates bottlenecks that prevents support from resilience from happening. And that networks of practitioners still for me, are one of the most promising avenues to go on. Let's compare it with health. This is a digression. One approach to health care says that all people's bodies are the same and that therefore a single intervention like a vaccine is all you need to do to improve health and save life. And over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a large amount of money pursue that paradigm. But there's another approach to health that says that each individual is different and that in fact healthcare needs to pay, account, pay attention to the characteristics of the individual and consider the relationship between the individual and the treatment. And only then is true well-being and empowerment created. Of course, people say, it's far too expensive and difficult to do population-wide health care that takes account of the individuals of the interests of individuals. But the alternative argument is that if population-wide health care works with people and accepts and understands their points of view, then it is more likely to be sustainable. So in conclusion, 
I believe that if we take a people first and society first approach to thinking about the autonomies necessary for resilience, we are more likely to be able to advance and advance in a very promising way than if we stick back in silo pushing mentality. And I think we've moved some way towards thinking about this in the panel session today. Thank you.